right. Well, hello to everyone tuning in tonight on Zoom and Facebook. Welcome back to Rabble's Off the Hill political panel series. My name is Libby Davies, and I'm very happy to be joined by my co-host tonight, Robin Brown. Hello, Robin. Hello. I'm joining from the unceded traditional and ancestral territory of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish Coast Salish peoples. Hello, everybody. Welcome to all our panelists. Uh, I am joining you from the uh, unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. Okay, thanks, Robin. Well, we're very delighted to be back from our summer hiatus and to kick off this season of Off the Hill with a focus on reconciliation. And I got to tell you, we're joined by a powerhouse panel this evening. So first of all, welcome back to Leah Gazan. Hello, Leah. Leah is the Member of Parliament for, Win uh, for Winnipeg Centre, and she is currently the NDP critic for Children, Families and Social Development, as well as the Deputy Critic for Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship. Leah is a member of the Wood Mountain Lakota Nation, located in Saskatchewan Treaty 4 territory. Leah is a regular guest on Off the Hill, and Leah, we're very glad to have you join us tonight. We're also delighted to introduce uh, and to welcome to the panel this evening, Georgina Lazor. Georgina is from the Tisquala First Nation, um, which is uh, located on the cusp of the Shushop and Lillooet. She is currently resides in Cornwall, Ontario, with her husband, five children, and eight grandchildren. Georgina works as a respite counselor and was recently elected to hold a seat on the board of directors for the local Children's Aid Society in Cornwall. So welcome to you, Georgina. And tonight, we also welcome for the first time, Brianne Lavallee Heckert. Brianne is the research manager at Indigenous Climate Action. She's a Machif woman with German settler ancestry from Red River and Treaty One territory. Her Machif family is from the Métis community of St. Ambrose, Manitoba. Brianne holds a Bachelor of Arts in Human Rights from the University of, Win of Winnipeg, as well as a Bachelor of Civil Law and Juris Doctor from McGill University. Welcome to you, Brianne. And of course, a special welcome also to everyone who registered for this event on Zoom. Uh, please participate in the chat or ask questions to our panelists through the Q&A function. And we always do our best to address your questions during the panel. And for those of you watching on Facebook, hello to you. And a reminder that if you'd like to participate in future events, all you have to do is simply sign up to Rabble's free newsletter to get a notification for the Zoom. So over to you, Robin. Thanks, Libby. Um, welcome back uh, to well, our, our viewers online and those uh, new folks joining us, uh, hello. This month, our panel is reflecting on truth and reconciliation in honor of the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation on September 30th, Orange Shirt Day. This evening, our guests will be discussing the ways Indigenous peoples are exercising sovereignty every day and the tangible ways settlers in Canada can take action at the federal and provincial levels for meaningful change. So to start, um, a question to, to all our panelists, so feel free to, to jump in. Um, we we wanna dive right into what we think is a central question, and that is what is the role of media coverage? Um, what does it play in terms of indigenous sovereignty issues? Is it, is it helping or hindering reconciliation efforts? I, I'd like to start with uh, you, Brianne, and your work with indigenous climate action. What, what do you think? Yeah, um, I actually was really excited to see this question. Um, I like to think about media in, in two different ways. Um, in, in climate work, we talk about two-eyed seeing. Um, it's the concept where you have the Indigenous worldview, um, and then you have a Western scientific worldview. So took a two-eyed seeing approach to answer this question, because I think that um, as Indigenous peoples, we have a different understanding of media. Um, I'll maybe start with my understanding of the Western states idea of media and its function. So I know the idea of like the fourth estate is, is you know, sort of the foundation of our modern sense of what we know as media um, and the role of, of journalism and holding the state accountable, you know, I think is sort of the crux of the issue of media is 
that's what we have media for. It's an essential function within the Western democratic state to ensure that elected leaders are held accountable. And that's, that's the function of it. Um, and because of that, it's, it's political, it's charged, you know, you see um, on both sides, it's, um, you know, even worse now with social media, with algorithm, algorithms and the way in which um, you can just really get lost into a particular feed. So um, in terms of whether it's helping or hindering from that Western perspective, um, I don't know. I think that it, it's um, in some instances, I think it's probably helping um, to, you know, at least have some visibility to issues. You know, there are people who don't even know the history of residential schools, despite the TRC, despite the MMIW inquiry. Um, so, you know, it's essential for, for raising awareness of basic issues. But, um, you know, you have to wonder, like, what's the what, how much can we rely on that? And I think about um, the role of storytelling for Indigenous people. I think that ultimately at the end of the day, media can only go so far. People can tell their own stories. And when, I think the vision that we have is, is a world where everybody is empowered to tell their own stories. And that's the Indigenous worldview where everybody um, can come into the circle and can tell their own stories in a fair way. And I think about, you know, the coverage of like what's Wootin, what's going on over there. Um, you know, you don't get into the complexity of these issues. You don't get into the, the you know, what's the difference between Indian band governance and, you know, hereditary chief governance. You don't get into those complexities. And that's not even, you know, re like recognizing the fact that a lot of, um, um, you know, people don't even know what the Indian Act is. So how can you talk about hereditary governance versus um, uh, Indian Act governance if, if people don't even know what the Indian Act is. So I think about, you know, how we can move towards a, a society where we can all tell stories together and where um, Indigenous people are empowered to tell their own stories on their own terms. Um, because, you know, the history of colonialism has been that we haven't been able to tell our own stories. So I think that that would be, you know, my understanding of it um, is to, to move towards that, is to, to think about media as storytelling. And then maybe that's how we can tell truth, you know, is if it comes from the heart. And that's really the only way that we can ever say truth is if it's from here and if it's our own, so. Georgina, you wanna chime in? Yeah, I'd have to agree that um, a lot of the truth is gonna come from, from, our, from our people. And I believe that's where it has to come from. Um, as for media, I don't, I, I, I don't believe that we have enough media on our side to get the full story out there. Um, we have a long, 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 hard job ahead of us to get the truth out there. Um, it's true that the mainstream people, they don't know the, uh, I had a march here in Cornwall in uh, June of last year, and I took a stand for 10 days at the uh, church here, and I had many people stopping by and letting me know that they were so unaware. So yeah, we do have a long, tough job ahead of us of getting this story out there. Thanks, Regina. Uh, Leah? Well, I totally agree with both uh, Brianne and Georgina. Um, in saying that, I think, you know, uh, with social media and certainly what we see going on in Wasowatan territory, people like uh, Brandy Morin that have been like boots to ground, uh, getting that coverage out stories that historically have not been told are really critical, you know, because, you know, the media typically, you know, historically, you know, I just turned 50, you know, I remember the Oka crisis and how biased uh, the media was during the, the, the siege of Ganesatage, you know, and uh, it was hard to get stories out. And I think, you know, with independent media, like even, you know, not to toot your horn, but I'm going to toot your horn, like mm -hmm. independent media, like rabble, I mean, this, you know, uh, rickshaw, you know, ricochet, you know, the tie, like, I mean, you, you're looking at more independent media. I think these kinds of media outlets are really critical to get uh, other stories out and stories and perspectives that aren't generally carried uh, by mainstream uh, media. Um, I also think the way it's being used right now is really harmful, uh, particularly with social media. I think it's good on one hand, but I think it's also been a venue that has really provided, you know, for example, um, you know, uh, you know, alt-right uh, white nationalist groups with a platform uh, to really spew hate, uh, conspiracy theories. And so I think, you know, we on one hand, it's good, but I think, you know, uh, the other area we need to look at is, you know, really supporting media literacy, 
uh, so people can have a critical eye on on truths. And, uh, you know, that's why, you know, I think it's great on one hand. I, you know, I look at Brandy Morin in, in West, so West Sowetan territory. That story would never be told, especially um, last year when the RCMP uh, came in uh, and took down the cabin with two unarmed women with with two uh, with a chain and axe and a guard dog. I use that example all the time. In fact, in the House of Commons, who would have known that story? if it wasn't for independent media and people that were boots to ground that took those videos and showed it to the world, showed it to the world so that there actually from that has been an international response. I, I was just gonna jump in quickly, Robin, to follow up your question, um, because I think Leah, your example of sort of the self-reporting and the transparency that comes from that um, has had it an impact on mainstream media because they get forced into a reality of showing what the truth is. But just as a quick follow-up, um, I'm wondering, I mean, all three of you are activists, you're leaders in your own community. How easy is it for you to access the media? Like when you want to get a story out, uh, Georgina, you talked about the action that you took last year. Have you found it uh, really difficult to um, access the media yourselves to actually get out what you're trying to do? Is there resistance to that? You have to keep pushing, keep pushing, or has it gotten a, sort of a better situation? Anybody want to weigh in on that? Well, as for myself, I find um, with the 215, I've uh, met some really good reporters out there from the local area that are really interested in uh, learning and getting the true story out there. So um, in that point of view, I find the local local news here anyways, really interested and they've uh, really picked me up. Uh, for example, Nick, I talked to Nick during my 215 March there and he's reached out to me. So I really appreciate that. That's good to hear, yeah. Yeah, I think that I've had um, experiences with media, um, like fairly people who are fairly interested in covering stories, especially um, I organize with a group called Red River Echoes um, in Winnipeg, a, a Métis um, group that's working on abolition and land back in, in Red River in Winnipeg. Um, and our, our collective has had mixed experiences, I guess. Like, I think there is an appetite for for those stories, but, um, you know, we're, we're not the only um Métis voice. There's also other um, Métis factors within Métis politics that influence how um, we show up in the media. Um, and I think that that's something that I've experienced is, um, you know, being extracted from from um, settler colonial media, um, where, you know, they, you know, just want the one Indigenous voice to check the box for their story. And um, it's really important to avoid those sorts of things. And I think um, it's important to have relationships with, with people who are covering our stories. Um, that's one thing that I, I would say for sure. Mm -hmm. And for you, Leanne, uh, Leah, it, how is it different from Ottawa or Winnipeg? Different well, kind of reaction? It's 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 really bizarre, actually, because prior to being elected, like I was, you know, um, a, a longtime advocate, longtime local uh, activist, and I actually got lots of media, uh, you know, <laughs> prior to being elected. And I actually find that now being an elected official, I have to push for stories often I've taken positions. I think it's no secret that are, you know, uh, contrary to, to positions that are being taken in Ottawa. And, uh, you know, sometimes those stories are hard to push out. But, um, you know, I, I think, you know, after three years of being elected, I'm finding different ways uh, to, to, to get that message out. A lot of it actually has to do with just doing my own op-eds, uh, you know, and getting them published in, in different newspapers, uh, you know, rabble, like you've been wonderful in terms of getting, you know, alternative messages out. And I think it is a struggle, uh, but I do think with like a, a changing kind of social media environment, media environment, that store, it's getting easier to get stories out. And these stories are critical. These stories are critical, not just uh, in Canada, but I think it's important for the international community to know exactly what is going on in Canada right now, including uh, ongoing, we're talking about reconciliation here, uh, ongoing um, violence, colonial violence against Indigenous peoples on unceded territories. 
you know, uh, with militarized police, you know, we talk about a violent land dispossession. Well, that's happening in Canada. And that's happening by state police that are paid for by governments. And so I think these are important stories to get out, especially at a time in reconciliation. I think before you can reconcile anything, you need justice. But before you can have justice, you have to have truth. So I think it's allowing us to get some of those hard truths out. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned some of the writing that you've been doing, Leah. And I know that in the chat, we just posted uh, the op-ed piece that you just recently did for uh, the Toronto Star. And that's a good segue to the next question. And I'll start with you, Leah. Uh, Parliament was back this week. So you're back into the fray of things in Ottawa. Um, and I guess the question is, how do you see Indigenous peoples exercising their sovereignty in the current political environment, uh, notably with the impact of the right, particularly with the new Conservative leader, Polyev, now in play? Very curious to get your, your views on that, not just in terms of this week of Parliament, because obviously it just began, but you know, watching that whole leadership race in the Conservative Party, all that went on there. Um, so why don't you start us off with that, Leah? And I would certainly invite Brianne and Georgina to jump in on this one too, because it is a question I think on everybody's mind, the changing political landscape uh, and the introduction of the new Conservative leader. And what, what does that mean in terms of Indigenous sovereignty, Leah? Well, you know, you know, in terms of, you know, the the, the different uh, political environment uh, in the House of Commons, I think it's no secret that the current uh, leader of uh, the Conservative Party has made statements that have been blatantly racist, particularly in regards to residential school uh, warriors uh, in the past. He has a history of it. It's documented in media. Uh, it is deeply troubling to me. Uh, also, uh, he is, you know, the leader of a party that that uh, in a united front voted against the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, a minimum human rights document. Uh, this is deeply troubling. And the Conservative Party isn't getting more progressive. I mean, they might have mm -hmm. been talking about food banks today. Uh, they're actually getting more regressive and they're getting more, uh, they're moving farther to the right and they're fraternizing with quite frankly, what I think are really troubling groups. Like, for example, uh, you know, it's no secret that Pierre Polyev was handing out donuts and coffee to leaders of the convoy and, you know, that are led by folks like Pat King, uh, who's a known hate leader. I mean, this is deeply troubling that somebody like that can lead a federal party. So I did feel obliged to write an op-ed to talk about hard truths about the, the current uh, conservative leader and saying that I think, I don't think uh, sovereignty has ever changed. I think, you know, indigenous peoples continue to exercise sovereignty, whether it's in Swetmik territory, uh, whether it's in Wesotan territory, whether it's in Ganazadage, you know, my good friend, Ellen Gabriel, uh, she's never uh, uh, seated. Uh, she's, she's been on the front lines I've, I knew I first met her in the news during the siege of Ganesatage, and it's not changed. So I think people continue to exercise uh, that sovereignty. They, I don't think the focus needs to be uh, on us. I think it needs to be on a government that does not respect uh, in terms of, you know, in terms of their rights, uh, their legal, their, their, their willful violations of the legal sovereignty that is held by Indigenous people on these unceded territories, for example. Um, and uh, so I think we continue to practice our sovereignty and, and uh, in different spaces and we lift up our voices. I'm currently in the House of Commons. Uh, that's, pr I call it the eye of the colonial storm. That is the most colonial, colonially mm -hmm. violent place you could ever find yourself. It's a tough slog, but if I'm not there, who's going to bring this stuff up? in that place. So um, yeah, so that's, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, exactly. And um, Georgina, just, you know, in terms of the, the rise of the right uh, and, and how Leah has described what that new environment is like, are you finding that it's created more division, you know, that it's harder to kind of bring people forward or how, how does it look to you in terms of the changing political landscape? Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't have much faith in the uh, any political party. Um, there's never any change. Doesn't matter what 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 
political government is in there. Um, again, we do practice all our sovereignty, at least I do. Um, I, I did uh, actually come far east here in uh, 1990. I was uh, at the Oka crisis, so I'm very well of that. And, you know, you look 30 years ahead and we not much has changed, not in, in anything in other than us standing up and uh, practicing our sovereignty and trying to get the truth out there. Okay, I hear you, yeah. And Brianne, uh, any, any perspective or views that you have about what the political landscape looks like these days in terms of Indigenous sovereignty and issues that you're, you're working on? Yeah, um, I think I, I follow along Georgina's line of thinking. I also don't really have an, any faith in the uh, settler colonial system, but um, I do really appreciate folks like Leah. Um, I think that there's, um, I, I went through this analogy when I was in law school, I don't remember which professor shared it, but um, that when we're you know doing this work of decolonization and reconciliation and all these other words that we're doing, we need to have people who are closing the door and who are holding that door shut so that you know we can protect against all of the ongoing colonial violence. And we need to have folks who are building something new for when when those folks finally you know stop trying to you know commit genocide against our peoples. Um, Cause that's their ongoing reality. You know, and I really appreciate that being brought up because um, you know, working in climate justice, um, we see that all the time, you know, the, the absolute greed of, of colonial governments of industry to just extract and exploit from our lands. And, um, you know, there's no real solution. There's no real, you know, imperative of, of the government to act on this, but this is catastrophic. We have people who are dying, you know, of, you know, heat domes and um, communities displaced from fires and floods. Um, and this impacts all of us, you know, and so I, you know, we are exercising our sovereignty, but if we lose our land, we're going to lose who we are. And I think it always needs to come back to that, um, to that relationship with the land. And uh, so, uh, you know, I, um, I, I'll maybe share, a, in terms of the Pierre Polyev thing, I'm going to share a quote from uh, Dr. Cindy Blackstock. Mm -hmm. um, she said in this um, one article here, from a strategic point of view, it would be more difficult to make the case for reform with a government that smiled at Aboriginal peoples while preserving discriminatory policies than with a conservative government, which was openly adverse. So yeah, I think this speaks to some of the you know ongoing um, refusal of the Liberal government to honor um, the uh, case of the First Nations Caring Society. You know these you know very clear things that could just be so simple. Um, you know, but they choose to, you know, willfully deny it while still, you know, saying that they're our friends and they're our allies and they're working towards reconciliation. Um, so I don't know if it really matters which who we have. Um, you know, I think we've had fascist leaders in Canada before, John A. Macdonald, you know. Um, it, it wouldn't be new in Canadian history to have somebody like that. And I think that that's a legacy that Canadians should um, should think about. Yeah, well, it's a great quote from Cindy Blackstock, and I, I think it's it's very relevant in terms of, you know, sometimes you deal with political operatives who say one thing, but their words are not followed by actions. And then sometimes, you know, you can clearly see who the adversaries are, and it's very transparent. And in some ways, it makes it easy to deal with. So it's, it's a pretty observant uh, quote that you, that you put out there from her. Um, just... Uh, you know, I appreciate the comment about needing to have voices on the inside, you know, and I, Leah, I've watched you battle away in the House of Commons. And as someone who is there myself, I know what it's like, but you are facing so many obstacles. And so I, you know, I just want to give you a huge shout out. The fact that you're there, you're speaking out, you're using every opportunity and resource and tool and voice that you have to make you know, to push from the inside as well as the outside, because you're you're still very much an activist. So I, I do think it's really important for us to um, to understand the significance of what you and others are doing, um, which it which kind of leads me to the next question that I I think we'd all be interested to hear your views, and that is as we approach Orange Shirt Day, um, just simply, what are your three, it could be more than three, but what are your three top priorities that you have for Indigenous peoples that the federal government must act on, recognizing that, you know, um, 
it's very hard to get the federal government to act, but what are the priorities? I think identifying them and sharing that kind of um, information can help encourage uh, the broader community to get in and to also take action. So what are, what are your priorities? Why, why don't we start with you, Brianne? Um, what, what is it, what are the key things that you wanna see the federal government that they must act on? Yeah, so I don't know if I, um, <laughs> in terms of what I think the federal government could do, I, I, I actually think that it just needs to be land back. Um, mm -hmm. I think Indigenous sovereignty all the way, as we've expressed in this conversation already, Indigenous peoples are sovereign, we're still here. Um, and some of the biggest issues that I can say like need to be worked on, um, climate action absolutely needs to be dealt with um, for a variety of reasons. I don't think the settler colonial government is capable of responding to it. Um, one, I think mainly just like a structural issue, I think is that, um, you know, you get reelected every four years, but we need long-term action for climate. And so I just, you know, any steps that governments take can always be dissolved in the next parliament, depending who wins an election. And, you know, that's just not the type of um, stability that we need for um, actual climate action to be able to um, save our lands. Um, and, the next priority that I would um, highlight would be abolition. I think um, moving away from carceral approaches um, to how, how we handle justice. Um, you know, I think that we can agree as a society that we do not need to be inflicting violence on each other, that we can treat each other with compassion and love and recognize each other's humanity. We don't need to live in a world where um, police officers can kill you know, children in the streets in Winnipeg and get away with it. That's not a world that I wanna live in. Um, and I don't know if um, the federal government has any intention of moving towards um, abolition or um, dissolving any of the federal police. Um, you know, I think about as a Métis person, the Northwest Mounted Police were created to inflict genocide against our peoples in 1870 under uh, Garnet Wolseley. Um, and, uh, you know, that ended up becoming the RCMP. And so, you know, what does that say? You know, if this was the police force that was um, created to inflict genocide, I don't know if, um, if there's, that's a reasonable thing to, to consider moving forward with in the future. Um, and then my third priority is uh, solidarity with the Global South. Um, I think we need to uh, start looking beyond colonial borders because um, our climate is changing and um, there are people who, who need help. There are island states that are disappearing. Um, you know, there are people who are dying because of heat. Um, these are real issues and, and we need, there are people who are really, really needing help. And, and here um, in the global north where we have extracted so much from that part of the world, we, we have a responsibility um, to help our, our brothers and sisters who are in the global south. Um, you know, we've uh, really benefited as, as can, you know, even Canada itself has benefited so much from the extraction of, of the world's poor. And uh, I think that it's time to, to, um, to stop and to, to, return some of the, so many of the things that we have stolen from 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 people you know um yeah those would be my three priorities and i i, I again has to go to, to land back yeah well those are th three very major priorities and, and i just want to let you know that um here on the off the hill panel we've discussed uh, many times with different panelists all of those issues um including um you know defunding of police and from a federal perspective. And so we've had many illuminating discussions on some of these questions and what the federal government needs to do. Um, I'll just turn it over to you, Georgina. Um, what, what would you name as sort of your three top priorities that you think the federal government must act on? The three main uh, priorities for me, uh, the most important would be the Doctrine of Discovery um, slash Indian Act. Um, those got to go, they got to be abolished um, for any, you know, for any real truth to happen. This um, doctrine of discovery has been um, what started it all. It, it started the crusade against my people. And as long as that, that doctrine of discovery and the Indian Act is uh, alive, um, it's uh, still working towards colonizing my people. So it's really important that the federal government um, start looking at abolishing um, that doctrine. Um, uh, along I, Georgina, can yeah. I just jump in for one second? Can you yeah. explain? Can you explain to people 
what the doctrine of discovery is, because I only learned about, about it myself listening to a podcast by Michael Moore in the States who um, who was reading a letter from Buffy St. Marie who, who mentioned this. I'd never even heard of it. If you, if you explain to people what the doctrine of discovery is. Exactly. So, yeah, again, that's a, a that's a, another thing I'm running into a lot is people do not know what the doctrine of discovery is. So the doctrine of discovery is a uh, document uh, that was created in 1492. And it basically gave uh, the settlers um, rights to come and claim our land um, if we were not of Christian value. Um, basically, we were considered inhuman, and that gave them the right to come in and uh, take our land and do what they wanted with us. Okay. And that's, in a lump sum, that's basically what the Doctrine of Discovery is. And it's still in effect to today. It's, um, you know, it's just a short little few words there, but if anybody wants to learn any more, they can always Google it, Doctrine of Discovery. There's lots of information out there on exactly what it is, but it is a very a short little document that has holds so much power, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? Yeah, thank holds, you for that. Yeah, thanks, Georgina. And, and so you've mentioned the Doctrine of Discovery in the Indian Act. Anything, anything else that you see as um, a key priority that you're working on right now that the federal government must act on? I'd like to see accountability. You know, where everybody's talking about truth and reconciliation. And right now, when you take a look at it, it seems like everybody's already jumping into reconciliation. Everybody's mm -hmm. talking about reconciliation, but yet there's, there's still lots of truths out there that still have to be told and learned. And, um, not only that, accountability. You know, how, how can we have reconciliation without accountability? Um, we have a government, we have the queen, unfortunately, she's uh, passed on now, you know, we'll never get accountability from her. But we still have the Roman Catholic Church, we have the Canadian government, you know, they own, they owe us accountability. For mm -hmm. us to really move on to reconciliation, we need that accountability and we need those documents abolished so that we can really start moving forward and live in a peaceful world like we should be. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Georgina. And Leah, Leah, just following up on that issue of accountability, I mean, that's something that you have to deal with every day in terms of holding the government to account um on any number of issues but particularly on uh, indigenous sovereignty issues so what what are the priorities for you and how how are you moving forward on some of these big questions well certainly you know i'm in agreement with Bri brianna and georgina particularly around the doctrine uh, of discovery they need to rescind that doctrine but you know we're talking about you know, uh, Orange Shirt Day, uh, a, a day that is supposed to lift up residential school warriors. You know, we want to talk about accountability. They need to hand over the records. They need to hand over the records of, of individuals who went to residential schools and those who never made it home. That is a very, very easy thing that can happen. Uh, but there's all sorts of political and legal reasons why it's not. And that needs to be named. And people need those records need to be turned over uh, right away. Uh, that's something we want to talk about accountability. And the other thing is they need to stop fighting Indigenous peoples in court. You know, the, the federal government spends between 500 to a billion dollars a year fighting Indigenous peoples in court. Brianne brought up Cindy Blackstock, one of my heroes uh, in the universe, because she is a superhuman uh, who's taken on the federal government. You want to talk about somebody who <laughs> holds the government to account? That's Cindy Blackstock. You know, Cindy Blackstock holds that government to account. She is one of the reasons why the government is spending between 500 and a billion dollars a year fighting Indigenous people in court. So if this government is really serious about reconciling with Indigenous people, it needs to stop fighting little kids in court, First Nations kids in court. Uh, it needs to stop fighting uh, against, you know, Brianne talked about land back, you know, against, you know, uh, cases like we've seen in the Wesotan territory, which are clear cut cases, and they need to reconcile. And the only way that will happen is if they rescind the doctrine of discovery, you know, especially if we're talking about lands. So I think, you know, we're all kind of on the same um, uh, page, page on that. Um, and to lift up 
the voices of survivors and intergenerationally impacted individuals. You know, I remember uh, when I first heard about the 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 kids that were not discovered. It was in the TRC, in fact. But everybody was so surprised. It was part of the calls for action in the TRC brought up unmarked graves of kids that never made it home. This Everybody treated it like it was new news, even, it, even though it was in the TRC report. You know, families and communities deserve justice. I remember I, 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 there's, you know, I'm pretty thick skin, but there was a couple of days where I just could not keep it together because it was just so horrendous. And, you know, this country needs to reconcile with that. They need to provide support to families and communities so that we can get the justice that we deserve, you know, so that our families that have been impacted by these institutions get the supports that we need on our own terms, not dictated by government. And they need to start doing things like giving $5 million uh, when they started recovering uh, children uh, in unmarked burial grounds to so the RCMP who were put in place to apprehend our kids and to imprison them, imprison them in residential schools. They need to be accountable for that. These things need to be called out. And so I'm going to keep doing that in the House of Commons. It's sometimes a lonely slog, but you do have allies in there. And, and that's the thing. But more important, I'm unimportant. It's all the boots to ground that empower my voice in that place. Thanks. So, man. yeah, Sorry. It's a no, it's a topic. No, 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 no. <laughs> not, not, not sorry. The, um, not sorry. All, pa all power to you. Yeah. <laughs> the, Robin. Actually, I wanted to just to ask a follow up to, to Brianne, because Brianne, you were mentioning the in one of your priorities, abolition. And the I'm just wondering. So in the work that we do, uh, we run into like a lot, well, a good chunk of black folks who have kind of bought into the whole idea that no, you can't you can't abolish the police. We need them when the, the, some are even pro-police. We have an election going on right now in Ottawa. We have a lot of the candidates are actually like they want to throw money at the police, including some of the black ones. So I want to bring up you, you mentioned um uh the uh what's my brother's name here. Uh oh so the the, the Metis Manitoba or the Manitoba Metis Federation, David President uh, David Chatin is pro he's pro cop and he's pro pipeline, but he's in his seventh term. <laughs> right, so so there are clearly a lot of Métis who are who are, who are like pro Chatrin. So I'm just wondering how. It, it, I guess the question is, is there that also in, 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 in among Indigenous folk that like support for this and anti abolition Like you guys running into the same thing, or? I mean, most of the Indigenous people I know don't like cops. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, um, I grew up in Winnipeg, though. We have a, you know, there's over 50% of the population here is Indigenous. Um, I, I grew up very much knowing that my aunties ran the show and that, you know, that was, you know, the the thing for me. And so I, I don't know if I've ran into that issue on a personal level. Um, politically, absolutely. <laughs> Within the Manitoba Métis Federation, there is definitely contention. Um, I def I've gotten criticism uh, from uh, the Manitoba Métis Federation about my uh, involvement with that sort of thing. Um, and um, yeah, I don't I don't know if it's... Uh, as widespread of an issue though, I would say, I would say, because I think as Indigenous people, we know that policing is new to our lands, right? That's not how we um, have, have always been, you know, we've governed ourselves without men with guns for a long time on these lands. And so this idea that we need to violently enforce law is, is a colonial one. Um, and I think that uh, a big part of this too, for me, I think is, has really just been focusing on myself and um, you, cause really at the end of the day, all you can really do is, is change your own mind. And I think uh, one of my colleagues at uh, Indigenous Climate Action does a lot of um, organizing with a group called Winnipeg Police Cause Harm as well. And uh, she always says, you have to get rid of the cop in your own head. And I think that that's the thing that we all just need to do. Um, and as Indigenous peoples, um, definitely we have different experiences with police officers. Um, but I think in my personal experience, it's, I've, I've been um, lucky in one sense that I've been around and supported by people who, who are abolitionists throughout my life. Um, but on the other hand, I think politics just sort of changed the conversation. And uh, I think it's why I like to steer away from, from that and really just focus on Indigenous sovereignty issues and decolonizing and getting rid of the cop in your own head, because mm -hmm. that's all we can do. <laughs> yeah. 
No, thanks. Actually, Leah and Georgina, we'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that one. On abolition? Well, specifically, the the is it among indigenous folks? Is there any in terms of abolishing the police? Yeah, is there any support for do you have people who don't want that who actually support the police well, or? I think it's important to say, like, as Indigenous people, we're diverse. Like, it's like I get this asked, asked this question all the time in the House of Commons. They're like, when I ran against the incumbent in my riding, we're both Indigenous. And they're like, well, you're both Indigenous. How are you different? I'm like, OK, let, where can I start? It's like. You know, we can start gender, like, you know, like we're diverse, we, we have diverse experiences. And, um, you know, I think there's a tendency, especially with Indigenous folks, just to kind of lump us in as one human, when we're actually quite diverse in our thought in terms of my own uh, opinions, it's certainly in the writing uh, that I represent, I've been very vocal, you know, like, we can't police ourselves away out of uh, some of the challenges we're facing in Winnipeg Center. You know, I represent a riding in the country that competes at being the second or the third poorest in the country. And, you know, I, and what I've said very clearly is you can't police your way out of it. We know that. Uh, we have a uh, a place called Air Canada Park, you know, and what happens is like there's a lot of people with complex mental health and trauma, a uh, lot of issues around poverty, and they they go there, they arrest people, and then they go back to Air Canada Park because that's not the issue. The issue is not a criminal issue; it's a human rights issue, it's a housing issue, it's a poverty issue, it's a it's a frontline organization issue, and I think we need to divest uh, from the police. We need to divest those resources and we need to put it in mental health foot patrols, uh, you know, frontline community organizations and invest in people. You know, um, you know, we know, for example, that uh, the majority of Indigenous women that end up incarcerated are for issues of poverty, period, period. And we know once you're incarcerated, it causes all sorts of it, it, you know, if you didn't have it, all sorts of extra mental health and, and trauma issues. So what's the point of that? We need to invest in people. We need to make sure people have the resources they need. And it has to come from a place of care. And it has to be founded and rooted and grounded mm -hmm. in a human rights approach. You cannot police, uh, you cannot pol replace that with policing uh, people. It just doesn't work. We know that. And I know in my community since the pandemic, uh, we've had we in Winnipeg, we have one of the highest police budgets. Things have never been so stressful. You know why? Because they have used all that money that needs to be invested in people. I think our community would look a hell of a lot better if we mm. just put that money into people mm. in our communities. No, th thank you for that. Um, we do want to get to 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 audience um, questions, but before we do that, we have one last one we want to ask you. Um, many of the people watching tonight will be from diverse urban and rural communities across the country. And we know that many of the people who come to Ravel for news are people already engaged in their communities. Uh, what actions, uh, if any, would you encourage settlers to take that can lead to tangible change no matter where they are in the country? Why don't we start with Georgina? Yeah, I would, uh, I would suggest to continue learning, learning from all sources. Um, also, continue and keep on after your government to get the uh, doctrine and the Indian Act rescinded. Those are what we can do. You know, education is our best friend. Educate, educate, and learn. Thanks. Um, Brianne? Yeah, I think um, one thing that I would say is to um, uh, slow down, honestly, and um, I think the sense of urgency, this patriarchal idea that everything needs to be like right away, I think is something we need to deconstruct and move away from because when we act urgently without thinking or without, you know, moving forward in a good way or consulting whoever needs to be consulted, we do more harm. And I think our communities have seen a lot of that of, of settlers wanting to help and acting urgently and not, um, you know, doing the, the proper uh, research first. And, you know, there's there's protocols that need to be followed. There's different things. Um, so I would say just slow down and um, uh, build relationship because that's really what we're what, what it's about um, when we're talking about reconciliation. It's not some abstract, you know, the Canadian state and individual and, you know, the individual. It's it's we're people and we're all living on this land together and we need to um, start building relationships if we're going to, you know, 
move forward together. Well, thanks, uh, Leah. Well, I think, you know, echoing what Georgina said, I think it first starts with self. And I think it's about learning. I'm reading a book called uh, White Fragility right now. I, I was reading it uh, in the House of Commons today. It's keeping my spirit alive. But just learning about self and learning about where you learned uh, certain values and where those beliefs come from and how to unlearn some of those. But I think, you know, as a longtime educator prior to being elected, what I found was I used to teach a course called Aboriginal Education is that a lot of the students in my class at the start never even heard a residential school. You know, Canada has a lot of dirty little secrets that, that it's hid that are now coming to the surface. And I think it's time for people to stop and learn. But your learning is only as good as your action. And I think there's things that you can do independently as a person uh, to change what you do uh, every day in the world in a very simple way. Um, and then, you know, there's other things that you can do in terms of really getting involved in active change. And part of that, which is, I think is the most difficult part, is when you really are committed to justice, a lot of it means that very often we have to give up our power and privilege. And here's the thing, we will not shift, see a shift in this country, unless we see people be in, that have benefited from systems of oppression start giving up some of their power and privilege. And so I encourage that thinking, um, you know, in, in moving forward. I, I certainly have to do it myself in terms of reconciling my history and finding peace with my own uh, colonial history and how it's impacted me and my family so that I can be in the world in a way that is good to others, but also in a way that still feeds my own joy. I have to reconcile mm -hmm. that. No, no, thank you. Um, no, thank you all for a, uh, a, a great uh, discussion. We, um, we now have some time for, for audience questions. So, uh, and they are, they've been coming in here. So um, uh, this one is definitely for, for, for all of you. And this is, um, we have uh, listeners asking, uh, on the issue of a land return, how is the valuation of land made? If the land is not returned, what kind of agreements would be acceptable? Who wants to jump in on that one? I can maybe jump in on that. I think part of land back is also the abolition of ideas that we can actually own land. We can't own the land. The land is our relative, land is our mother. Um, we cannot own it. We cannot put a dollar value on it. Um, and that's what we need to move away from. And that's what land back is about. It's about the return of indigenous legal orders to these lands so that we can govern in a way that is not based on its systems of extraction like capitalism or colonialism. Um, so I think in terms of what land back would look like, it it, it really just looks like, a, I think, the eradication of extractive practices on our lands and the rest restoration of indigenous models of governance um, that would be my my understanding and in terms of what kind of other agreements would be acceptable I, that would i guess de depend on the nation you know i think that that's what we need to look back to is that um outside of canada there are many 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 indigenous nations across um across this land and uh that's what we need to look to no thanks um uh, georgina yeah, I'd have to agree, you know, land back, it's a big uh, question and it is uh, kind of figuratively because, you know, we're never going to get all our land back. But again, we do need to be recognized and that is uh, coming, you know, we do have recognition now, you know, a lot of people are opening with uh, land recognition. So that's a, that's a really good start right there, recognizing that uh, we do own the land. Um, I think moving forward would be um, having um, our, our governments, our, our chiefs and anybody involved in more of the decisions on what is happening with the resources taken from our land. No, thanks, Regina. And Leah? Well, I agree with uh, everything that's been said, but just to add, like, I think it's also important to recognize when we're talking about land back that, you know, we can talk about land back, but, you know, 
that's only if you give gave your land away, right? Like if you see like some of the front line, like the the critical front line of resistance that's happening in the country. These are on unceded territories. Like I always feel weird when I say, "Oh, I'm on unceded Algonquin territory," and like the there's the most colonial building that ever that ever happened in the universe, right? And I'm sitting in it, and we're like, "Oh, I'm on unceded territory." Sorry about this monstrosity of a colonial structure. I mean, like it's a bizarre, like it's a bizarre thing. Like when I'm saying it, it feels weird, but uh, but I think I think it's also important to 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 um acknowledge that and respect that and and up and uphold it and uphold it uh it, those rights in the country um but but also you know very much what uh brianne said in terms of you know acknowledging like in, indigenous sovereignty over land looking at deconstructing notions of ownership of land and maybe having discussions around that and what that looks like i think a lot of people find that term really scary uh that term really scary but i think that scariness comes from a misunderstanding of what it actually means no thanks um all right. The next question uh, goes back to the topic we started off with, which is media. Uh, do you think the growth of Indigenous media with APTN, Media Indigena, CBC Indigenous, maybe and maybe and, and, and others are changing the way other media report? And they say, uh, if you could change one thing about how how mainstream media report, what would it be? So why don't we why don't we go back in reverse order? Start with Leah. Well, I do think, uh, the, you know, media outlets that you mentioned uh, certainly do uh, assist. I think representation does matter. Um, you know, I mean, we we spoke about it in the beginning. There's a lot of stories uh, that aren't told uh, in mainstream media. And I think that's why, you know, quite frankly, independent media sources like Rabble, uh, ricochet, you know, come to the Thai E. I mean, those are three that come to mind that they're so critical because often, uh, you know, independent media tell stories uh, that otherwise wouldn't be told. And so, you know, and I think people are looking to, uh, for good or bad, like I think about Rebel News, I they're independent. I don't think they're so great. I think, you know, particularly because often it's not based on facts. But uh, I do think people are looking at more independent media store, uh, uh, sources, and I think they're critical to get messages out in a, in a number of different venues. Thanks. Uh, Brianne? Um, yeah, I think one, sorry, the question was recommendations for mainstream media, correct? Uh, the first part was, do you think the growth of Indigenous media, or the APTN, Media Indigena, CBC Indigenous, uh, are they changing the way other media report? Mm -hmm. um, I actually don't know. I, I, I don't know if, if, if I would know enough about what, how that's influenced them. Um, but I do think that one thing that Indigenous storytellers do well is um, you know, embed their per, like positionality within their stories. And I think that's something that maybe would be useful from mainstream media is, is more reflection from journalists about their own positionality and how that influences their stories. Um, I think as Indigenous people, we we always come with our full selves to, to any story we tell. And so um, I, I think that maybe it would be interesting for um, other journalists who are non-Indigenous to be able to um, locate themselves within their stories a little bit more um, and how they relate to that. Great, thanks. And, and, and Georgina, what, what do you think? I'd just like to say I agree with Brianna on that one, where they uh, they should bring more of their own personality into their stories to mainstream media. Um, I find it's all too, um, I guess, staged. I don't watch mainstream media, so um, and that's why I don't I don't feel they tell a biased story. So I like to stick with the independent news out there. All right, thanks. Um, we're getting near the end, but we've had a couple of questions. Actually, Brand, people are asking you to talk about your what you actually do at, with Indigenous Climate Action. Yeah, I'd love to. <laughs> so I'm the research manager with Indigenous Climate Action, and what that means is I get to um, do a lot of cool work with Indigenous knowledge 
Um, so a big chunk of our work is um, empowering and amplifying um, Indigenous communities to um, deal with, with climate change in a variety of ways, whether that's, um, you know, empowering people to, to know what's going on at the federal level in terms of climate policy. Um, a big project we have right now that we're working on is called Decolonizing Climate Policy. Um, we actually have a phase one report that's out um, now and we're in the middle of the phase two of the report that should be out by the end of the year. Um, but these reports look at um, cl climate policy and how we can decolonize that. Um, and, and our findings are that colonialism has caused climate change, that um, these industries and um, the relationship of colonial um, actors to the land has been harmful. And um, that's what's driving the climate, climate crisis. Um, and so in our, in our findings as well, we also um, make sure to amplify and highlight Indigenous climate solutions, um, which look like a lot of different things, you know, that's everything from sugar bushing to hide tanning, you know, any ways that we're, um, you know, building relationship with the land is, is a climate solution because as Indigenous peoples, that's, um, you know, we are, we are the land and so that's, um, uh, you know, why I always bring back land back is, is that is, um, is, yeah, so I think it's a big part of our work at Indigenous Climate Action is just saying that message over and over again is that um, colonialism caused climate change and Indigenous rights and Indigenous sovereignty is the solution. Robin, um, are you going to try and squeak it one more question? If it's a possible, actually, I, think... uh, I was going to do a quick, well, I just going to respond yeah. to that to say the, the uh, so I'm just reading um, uh, Rehearsals for Living by um, Robin Maynard and, and Leanne Simpson, the, their new book, and they, they I'm just curious there what you think because they they talk about the um the media reports and even the language in the reports from like the intergovernmental panel on climate climate change talking about um you know how climate change was caused by human activity and and uh, we must all fix it. I'm just wondering what your th and of course they critique that saying wait a second we <laughs> not everybody had, was had an equal. Yeah, I'm just wondering cur curious your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think one of the um, big things with climate action is that um, people imagine that human beings are not part of the natural landscape. Big part of colonialism is taking us away from the land. It's that separation of human beings from the earth. I think that's like sort of the fundamental definition of colonialism that I work with is separating people from the earth. Um, and, you know, I think that's the cause of so many of the issues that we're dealing with, you know, like people are sick and, you know, dealing with cancer and, you know, all sorts of things, because we're breathing in toxins all the time, you know, we live in a world where we're consuming microplastics, like I, we have like credit cards that like are in us from the microplastics that we eat, I think it's, you know, like those sorts of things, like that's, that's harmful to our spirits. Um, and so, yeah, I think that, um, uh, yeah, I think that's that's really where where we need to go is to uh, to thinking about it in that way. Thanks, Libby. Over okay. to you. Okay. All right. Well, um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions today. And I just want to thank everybody who's been tuned in for making your interventions. I know that the chat has been very active today, and I really want to thank uh, Leanne, Brienne, and Georgina. You guys have been just terrific in sharing really important truths and wisdom and realities um, as we approach Orange Shirt Day. Um, so thank you for that. You know, um, you've shared some very powerful information. And of course, thank you to Robin, my, my co-host. We, we sure enjoy doing this. And now that we're back uh, from our summer hiatus, we're, we're back in the swing of things. Uh, we will be back on October the 18th for an off the hill panel that's gonna be focused on Islamic history in Canada and the rise of Islamophobia. So another really important topic. Uh, you can for sure get an invitation for that event by signing up to Rabble's newsletter, which is rabble.ca slash alerts. And finally, uh, as always, just a thank you to Rabble for creating a space to host these kinds of discussions that we don't see enough of um, across the country. And we certainly encourage you to help Rabble out by becoming a monthly donor at rabble.ca slash donate. So thank you again to our three panelists. Really enjoyed uh, talking with you and discussing with you and stay tuned for October 18th. Thank you for joining us tonight. We'll see you next month. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.